Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on virology. In this video, what we're going to talk about is the uh, life cycle of HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, and uh, also the mechanism of action of many of the antiretroviral drugs. Okay, so this video is on the life cycle of HIV. So the structure then for this video, what we're going to begin with is discussing the structure of the virus HIV. Uh, then what we will do is uh, we'll discuss uh, the infection of the cell, i.e. how HIV virus particles actually infect the cell. We'll then discuss how uh, it implants its genome into the human genome, or well, the genome of the cell. And then what we'll discuss is how uh, the virus replicates within the cell. Okay, and then the budding off of new virus particles. And whilst we're doing it, what I will do is show you where uh, antiretroviral drugs hit uh, each of the um, steps of the life cycle of HIV. Okay, right. So we'll start off then with the structure of HIV. So the first thing to say is that HIV, which stands for human immunodeficiency virus, okay, so I think I should at least at some point write out its full name. Okay, so human immune deficiency virus. So H is for human, I is for immune, uh, then you've got deficiency, and some people combine the immune and the deficiency together to give immunodeficiency. I'll write them separately. Human immune deficiency virus. Okay, so the V is for virus. Right, now, there are two main divisions of HIV. There is HIV-1, human immune deficiency virus 1, uh, and then there is also human immunodeficiency virus 2. HIV-2. Now, mainly when people talk about HIV, they mean HIV-1. They do not mean HIV-2. HIV-1 is the one that has the highest incidence in the world. This is the one that's common within the US. It's the one that is common within uh, Europe. It's the one that's common in Central Africa as well. HIV-2 is much, much rarer, okay, and it's also much, much more difficult to transmit than HIV-1, okay, but it is found uh, in Western Africa and also in India, okay, so you can find HIV-2 in West Africa and India, but it would be very, very rare to find a case of HIV-2 in the US or Europe, okay, so HIV-1 and HIV-2. Okay, so these are the two different main two different types of HIV. We're going to see that uh, there are a huge number of different types even under this, so the classification goes much more than this. There are many different strains of HIV, and all of them will be categorised either into HIV-1 or HIV-2, uh, but within HIV-1 or HIV-2 there are then lots of different uh, subgroupings after that. Okay, so usually when people say HIV and they do not, um, they do not, you know, clarify which of the two types they mean, they will be talking about HIV-1. And this entire video is really going to be on the life cycle of HIV-1. Most of it is applicable to the life cycle of HIV-2 as well. But HIV-1 is the more common infection in the uh, human population, so we're going to study HIV-1. Okay, so we'll start off then with the structure of a HIV-1 virus particle. So, the virion particle itself is spherical, and basically uh, you have a layer of phospholipid bilayer. Okay, so you have um, a membrane called the viral envelope surrounding the entire virus particle. Okay, so I've drawn this here. So this is what's known as the viral envelope. And this basically is a phospholipid bilayer that the virus particle has stolen from the cell that it budded off, basically. And we'll see right at the end when we uh, see virus particles budding off uh, the cells that they have infected, we'll see where this viral envelope comes from. And basically, it's just cell membrane that the virus particle has stolen. Okay, so we'll colour in the viral envelope in blue here. So this is a phospholipid bilayer, so it's 
got an inner leaf fit and an outer leaf fit of phospholipids. Okay, now underneath, just underneath the viral envelope, what you then have is another spherical um, surface of uh, proteins that supports the viral envelope. Okay, so underneath what you'll then have is a sphere of proteins that supports the viral envelope. And this is what's known as matrix proteins. Okay, so I'll colour in uh, this matrix protein in green here. Okay, and specifically the protein that makes up this spherical matrix here is uh, called P17. Okay, so in turquoise here. Right, so this is what's known as the P17 matrix uh, for the um, HIV virion particle. Okay, so it's not just one protein. What you'll do is you'll take absolutely a huge number of P17 proteins. You'll stick them all together to make a surface of a, the surface of a sphere, and that sits just underneath the viral envelope, holding it in the spherical shape. Because you might wonder, well, why does the uh, membrane stay in the spherical shape? Uh, I mean, you know, it's a very sort of flexible structure, so you'd expect it to be changing shape continuously. Okay, but it's because it's got this P17 matrix. Matrix, uh, which is a spherical uh, shape underneath it that's very rigid and holds it up. Okay, so uh, that's the viral envelope and the P17 matrix. Now, within the P17 matrix, what you then have is the nucleocapsid, and this basically is in a sort of cone shape. Okay, so the nucleocapsid is the combined name for the capsid along with uh, the stuff inside it, okay? So inside of the matrix, the P17 matrix, you will have the nucleocapsid. And the nucleocapsid is made up of the capsid, which is this outer shell that's in the sort of shape of a cone here. Okay, so I'll colour this in now. So in red here, this is the capsid. And again, this is made up out of loads and loads of protein, basically. And the protein which you make the capsid out of is called P24, okay? So, P24 capsid. Okay, so the capsid is made out of P24, so it's often actually called a P24 capsid. So, what, again, what you do is you take loads of these little proteins, P24, you stick them all together to make a cone like this. So, what you'll do effectively is this, if we zoom in on it, what you'll actually find is absolutely loads of these little P24 proteins all stuck together like so to make this sort of cone shape. Okay, and that's what is making this capsid, basically. Loads and loads of these little proteins, and it's the same principle for the P17 matrix. Loads and loads of little proteins all stuck together. Right. Now, what's within the capsid? Well, within the capsid you have uh, the genome of the HIV virus. And the HIV virus is actually uh, unusual for viruses. It's deployed. It has two copies of its genome, basically. It's kind of like humans. We are deployed. We have two copies of every single gene, a maternal copy and a paternal copy. So HIV virus particles are similar, and they have two copies of their genome. Now, unlike humans, their genome is not stored as double-stranded DNA. Instead, it's stored as single-stranded RNA. Okay, so let me colour in these particles in bright green here. So these are two mRNA pieces here. So these are two pieces of mRNA here. Okay, so this is single-stranded, so that's the SS, RNA, and it's what is known as positive sense, and I'll explain what that means in a moment. Okay, so you have these two pieces of single-stranded RNA which have are of positive sense. So what does it mean to be positive sense? Well, let's just have a little reminder of the central dogma of biology. Okay, so basically the central dogma of biology is that we start off with our double-stranded DNA here. So we're now talking about a human cell rather than uh, a virus. Okay, so we've got our double-stranded DNA here. So DSDNA stands for double-stranded DNA. Okay, and basically what then follows is transcription. 
okay? So we can't, the DNA is stored within the nucleus, whereas the apparatus for making proteins is within the cytoplasm. So we somehow need to get the information from, that's encoded in the DNA to the, the apparatus for making the protein. Now, we don't want to take our only copy of the DNA to this apparatus because, you know, there's the risk that it will never come back and we'll have lost it forever. So instead, what we do is we make a dispensable uh, copy of the, um, the DNA, basically. Okay, so transcription is going to occur. So basically, what you you do is you synthesize a piece of mRNA which will be complementary to your piece of DNA. Now, the question is, which of these two uh, DNA strands do you use to make the piece of mRNA? Well, you only use one. You don't use both. So, one of the strands, and let's say it's this one that I've coloured in turquoise here, will be called the coding strand. So let's say this is going to be the coding strand. And basically, the coding strand is the strand of DNA which you actually use to make the uh, mRNA, i.e. you will make an mRNA sequence that is complementary to this coding strand. The other strand of the DNA, which I'll colour in, in vivid purple here, this is called the non-coding strand. Okay, And this is the one that you will not use to make the mRNA. So this is non-coding strand. Okay, now what will then happen is we will make a piece of mRNA which is complementary to our coding strand. So we'll open up the DNA and then we will make a piece of mRNA that is complementary to our coding strand. So here in turquoise is our coding strand. Okay, and we've now made a piece of mRNA which I'll have in red here. Okay, which is complementary to that uh, coding strand. And then here, still in vivid purple, is the non-coding strand. Okay, so this is our piece of mRNA here. So, the mRNA will have a complementary sequence of organic bases to the coding strand. Okay, so it will actually have the same sequence of organic bases as the non-coding strand here. Okay, uh, except for the fact, of course, that we're dealing with RNA here and therefore thymine will be replaced by uracil. But apart from that, it will actually have the same sequence of organic bases as this non-coding strand here. Okay, so uh, this mRNA will then be capable of being translated. So you will take this piece of mRNA and uh, it will go through a ribosome. Okay, so here's a ribosome go through and then you will read the genetic code so you know of course that the um, genetic code is read in triplets so you will look at three organic bases together that's called a codon and this will code for a certain amino acid basically okay and you will put that amino acid in you'll then go to the next sequence of three amino acids to so the next codon along and that again will code for a single amino acid and you'll put that amino acid in and you'll continue on basically and that's called the triplet code so basically this piece of mrna could be read by a ribosome and could make the protein basically this is what would be called positive sense rna and people often just put plus VE instead of positive, that's shorthand for positive. Okay, so you take the VE at the end and then just put positive in front, uh, well, the plus sign in front. Okay, so positive sense RNA. So positive sense RNA is RNA that can actually be read by a ribosome and will make you the functional protein. So then what is negative sense RNA? Okay, so let me now explain what negative sense RNA is. Negative sense RNA is RNA which has a complementary sequence of organic bases to the positive sense RNA. Okay, so let me explain. So if instead we were to make a piece of mRNA which was complementary to the non-coding strand this time, okay, so let's make a piece of mRNA that's complementary to this vivid purple strand here. Now, colour this in in blue here. Okay, this, we could in principle put this for a ribosome and it could make a protein, providing of course you have a start code on at some point, but the protein will be completely different to this protein and will probably not be functional at all. Okay, so this piece is called the negative sense piece of RNA 
because it doesn't have the correct sequence of organic bases to actually make the functional protein. It actually has the complementary sequence of organic bases that you need uh, to make a functional piece of RNA which will actually be able to be translated. So this blue piece has a complementary sequence of organic bases to this red piece. Okay, so the negative sense RNA is a piece of RNA that is complementary to the positive sense RNA. Okay, so it can't be used to make the protein directly, but it actually contains the exact same genetic information as the positive sense RNA. In principle, if you give me the negative sense RNA, I could tell you exactly what sequence you need to make for your positive sense RNA, and therefore I have all the information I need to make the protein. I just can't use this piece of negative sense RNA directly to make the protein. So negative sense RNA contains the genetic information, but it's not not actually capable of making proteins. Okay, right, so that's the difference between positive sense and negative sense RNA, okay? And we'll continue this discussion in the next video.